black people and welcome once again for taking a part I mean god dog it <laughs> this is a moral high ground okay <laughs> and I'm the great Shelby that's okay and um, what I'm talking about once again this is part two of Alexander Ocasio-Cortez talking about the war on attack in Israel and the reason why it's part two is because it'll be a little long and I'll be explaining stuff so it makes it even longer. So we're going to jump right into it. I might be a little off so you might have heard this, what she's about to say, a little bit of what she's saying already in the first part of this episode because I can't remember exactly where I left off. But the whole thing is this is the show's moral high ground and the thing that's morally right or wrong here, is it right? for America to try to make a ceasefire or not? Is it right for Israel to uh, attack this other country in the way that they're doing so? And so this is something where I believe the moral values are just left up to God and the people who believe in God in that faith because that's what their nation is based off of. And all other nations are supposed to follow suit. At least that's the way I believe they would assume it to be. So anyway, we're going to move around and let's just jump in there and uh, explain. And like I said, you probably heard it already from uh, before. So, yeah. You know, there are some things that when we see them should just simply be an affront to humanity. When we see the atrocities that were committed in Israel on October 7th, when we see the atrocities of uh, in, in bombing these targets, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. Hamas is currently holding 200, about 200 hostages. Um, and they must be released. It's a war crime. There was something on the news recently where... Um they're asked the Hamas, Hamas, trying to say things politically correct. But anyway, they said that they had a list of the demands. And in that case, none of the demands had anything to do with getting anything back if they gave up the 200 hostages. And so they're planning to give up the 200 hostages, but they weren't really demanding things. The U.S. having a conversation with them, and they were kind of pissed off about the even asking what do they demand in return, and probably the, the demand is give back the hostages, leave them the hell alone. But who knows? So. <clears throat> it's a war crime. Um, the government of Israel, for many years, have been detaining innocent Palestinians without charges. And that also is something um, that should be named and raised. Additionally, I think another thing that we need to take uh, a look at, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of different elements to this, right? Um, but I think that the incredible amount, and someone said, you know, the, the hostages that um, Israel is holding, that is also something that should be discussed. That has come up over years. Um, and, uh, and that is absolutely, you know, the, the numbers and the estimates, I believe, are in the thousands. Yeah, I'm just saying with the hostage thing, it's just, it seems like um, to at least put ease to the war a bit or the attack or however you want to put it, that both countries have to get rid of hostages or imprison the people that were wrongly accused of whatever crime that they were falsely committed of. And so that would resolve things and then a ceasefire would make a hell of a lot more sense. But right now, in the current state of situations, I think things are just heated on both sides, and nothing can truly solve that until they can actually make a step to release these uh, hostages and prisoners, and then they might calm down a bit. But the death toll is, is over. It's just enormous, and it just keeps rising. And so that right there will still keep people heated and maybe continue to carry this war on months and years to come. But war crimes do not justify war crimes. And I think that that is something, you know, that is important to say and to center. 
Um, additionally, context is not the same thing as justification. And that's a two-way street, right? Context, we must talk about the context of what's going on. Um, but it's not the same thing as justification. Uh, and that's a two-way street. And so, um, you know, I, like I said before, this is an issue that there's no winning in speaking out on, right? There's no, I've learned that there is no right way. Um, so I'll pause on again because like I said before in the previous video, because I don't remember this part, is that, you know, they try to make certain politicians look dumb when they repeat words over and over again. And they try to make them seem, you know, you know just give this girl a chance, is all I'm saying. You know, she does come off like she's working for an agenda that's only serving the United States government. And it does seem like she has a heart of some kind. And sometimes the heart can be stone cold or, you know, as hard as rock, you know. But every now and then, even a rock gets softened by a gentle, soft wave or breeze or sledgehammer. I, I had something, but I totally lost what the hell I was talking about. Hopefully it makes sense somehow. To discuss this, because as reasonable and as responsible as you try to be, you try to stand up against, um, against violence and the killing of children, you can be called both a terrorist sympathizer and on the side of oppression and with the establishment within the same minute talking about the same sentence. But that doesn't mean that we should be silent. That doesn't mean that we should watch this happen. And very often, someone will tell me, why, why care about this? And it is because this is one of the largest uh, places that we see our public, U.S. public funds go. The United States is an ally of Israel. There is no questioning that. There is no questioning that at all. So that whole thing right there with the Israel ally thing, it was funny when Trump was in office and his wife, or not his wife, I mean his daughter was married to a man that was Jewish. And so, you know, he started supporting the Jewish cause. But the thing about it was the whole situation that they played out with that was, was kind of bad. And I feel bad for Ivanka Trump because you know, she was just loyal to her father until her father pretty much said to hell with her. And it's just, it's, it's crazy how politicians fight for something and you want them to fight for you. But no matter how much they could say they're fighting for you, you know in the back of your mind, they're not truly working for you. They're working for their own agenda, their own wealth and their own benefit. If they were truly working for you, you would feel satisfied and justified. But there's no true justice or satisfaction when it comes to the regular population compared to those with power. You know, you want them to be able to fix the problem, to work with the people, to help the people, to guide the people so they can be happy. You know, share that power and that wealth, but they don't, they keep it for themselves. And with that situation, they're always going to be happy. But if the American people had a little bit of power and a little bit of wealth, the whole nation would be happy. And, and the whole truth about it is, the truth of the matter is, without the American people getting what they truly want, this little gameplay that the Democrats and Republicans play will always continue. And what every person want is money. They want to be happy, they want some money. How about pull out money from spending one year not worried about giving money to other countries, military operations and whatnot, and try to put money in the pocket of the American people without taxing them, without holding debts above them, and without penalizing them. And that would make more sense, you know, and 
focus more on truly trying to fix the situation with drugs and own the situation. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, too much. But, yeah, we have fixed everything. Because we all want to be happy. And because we don't get happy, there's a lot of people with negative thoughts, toxic personalities, and demented points of views. And this is because they never obtain the happiness and don't think they ever will. So it starts, I think it's a priority for the American government to truly make the American people feel happy. Not just go on on with the same rhetoric they've been going on with for hundreds of years. Not just sit back and try to make broken promises to the American people and tell them, hey, this is what's happening. Pretty much don't piss down our backs and tell us it's raining. Fix that damn problem so it don't look like it's raining at all. And that's just what I gotta say. And I would say to my friends um, who are, you know, have have been some of the most vociferous um, supporters of this alliance. What I would say is that when we talk about the value of democracy, what makes democracies different, the argument for democracy is that democracies are different because we respect rule of law, because we center civil and human rights, because we are civil societies that are democratically elected, that represent the will of the people. And in times of war, we should be upholding our democratic principles and be an example to the world about... So, what she was saying about there being an example for the people, and that's the part I have a problem with, with, with politicians, period, now. It's like I'm not as strong as politics as I was before, and I'm starting to f look at it a whole different light. A lot of it has to do with the Trump Biden thing. I don't care about neither one of those assholes. And, and the thing about it is, it's just, I think it's long overdue. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I don't know if any other American or any other person in the country feels the way I do. But years and years of watching the news, feeling patriotic at one point, they're not. They're not feeling like a citizen at all based off of your skin color and, and the way you are. And then constantly hearing all these broken promises that come about, it kind of makes you say, to hell with them. What the hell are they truly doing? I just honestly believe now that we need to get rid of both Democrats and Republicans. It's time for a whole new system. And I'm not talking about that Proud Boy bullshit they did in January 6th because that was some dumbass shit. You go in there and you destroy a capital for what? Just to sit there and take photos of like dummies dressed like bison and stuff? Like, what the hell was that? You know? You know, we go back to freaking, you know, colonial wartime and you got, you know, the Sons of Liberty, you got these patriotic guys that are sitting there, you know, fighting for freedom against King Charles, I think it was at the time. And you're sitting here and you get rid of colonials and they got the dude from Assassin's Creed helping out the people in the Boston Tea Party. You got all this crap going on that leads all the way back to Solid Snake and the law of the law. So it's all jacked up. And the main thing about it that doesn't make sense to me is if they were going to do all this stuff to go to the Capitol, why didn't they make a change? They didn't. It's the same thing with Black Lives Matter. They did this whole thing around the country. It really had nothing to do with black people, especially here in this state. Because this state is mostly white and they only care about white most of the time. They just try to make it seem like they have a heart so they can get more fundings and more uh, resources through the government. But the thing about it is Black Lives Matter, once again, came out strong prove like they were going to do something and never went to Washington to make a bill get passed so we can protect black people from being shot from cops or anything of that nature. They actually killed more black people during the Black Lives Matter riots, not protests, that people don't even talk about. I mean, I literally had somebody crying on the phone to me telling me about a boy that was hanging out with some girls, a little black boy, teenager or whatever, and they shot him dead just because he was black. During, during the protest times, supposed protests of Black Lives Matter, I had a situation where I was on a date with a girl and 
protest people were coming up talking about Black Lives Matter and this chick got scared of gonna come with you and all this type of shit. That's what I was thinking in my head. Because she's like, oh my God, they gotta come do something. We gotta go, Shelby, come on. And I'm thinking, what the hell is this so stupid? I'm about to be lynched by people talking about Black Lives Matter. Like, that's a way to tell you they're gonna come kill you. It's like, <laughs> it doesn't make any damn sense. It's so confusing. Just grab me a big. I got more appreciation for that than sitting there faking like you care just to try to do me in. And this is the main thing how racism popped up in this country. People act like they care when they really don't try to sucker you in so they can eliminate you. And that's just the truth. So my point is, before I go way off topic again and forget about this great woman talking, is plain and simple. It's time for a change that actually suits the people, cares about the people, not the same rhetoric about putting more jobs out there, health care, medical. If we got all this stuff out there, we should have taken president at least four years. You got four years to have this stuff. You should be eliminating, spending one month every day of that year. One month, focus on one issue, get it eliminated, bam, move on to the next issue. You got four years. And forget all this walking around, waving, press type stuff, going up on Air Force One, uh, and hanging out, shaking little people's hands and stuff. Just go handle the issue. Don't leave the White House until you've done the issue. You're the only job in the world, in this country, where you can just walk around and wave and say a bunch of bullshit. <coughs> if people believe it, you know? Excuse me for working. You say a bunch of bull and you expect people to believe it. It makes no sense to me. If I was president, it'd be every month I'd uh, work on one issue to get the nation right. I would eliminate the housing cost issue to where housing is so unaffordable for people and bring it back to zero, big reset. I would eliminate the whole process of, hell, the majority of these organizations that can't focus on one thing, but they keep adding more stuff to protect them and their organizations. You have to have solid, one-step process Otherwise, you're stepping on other things. It's changing other laws. and more laws and more laws. And it's blah, 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 blah. You know, so time for that. You know, you got to eliminate the process and have big repercussions on how cops are treated once they commit a crime. There should be no reason why they should get laid off from their job or retire when they kill somebody. Literally kill somebody. They should suffer the same fate as the person they eliminated. Same thing with lawyers, they should suffer the same fate as their clients. If the clients don't do five years, hell, that lawyer better be damn good to get himself off for five years. Because he's going to get himself off and that, and that client. Okay? There's so many different things I can go on and on about with this issue. But like I said, I was really strong in the politics. Now I'm against the whole thing because I know the truth. This is a war, a, a verbal war, a mental war. Because some people are so delusional and so diehard fans to their sports team. That's what they are. Democrats and Republicans are sports teams without uniforms that actually have to go into fields. So the thing about it is there's no point in being diehard for something you truly don't understand. No matter how much everyone thinks they know Democrats and Republicans, you don't because you're not sitting behind a chair in those buildings with them. You know, walking down the hallway, listening to their conversations. You're not sitting back at their little suppers or their house meetings and all that. So you don't truly know who's behind them or what's really going on. All we know is what they show us through media. And media itself is flawed. You know, they're playing a stripper role. There's no true, just like a reality show, it's scripted. A lot of stuff is scripted in the news. And then for anything, why the hell do we need to watch the news to figure out the weather when the weather be on your phone nowadays? Anyway, way, way off topic. Back to the great Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I'm sorry I posed her on a weird look. What makes democracies different? And even allies, or even if you are friends, if your friend, if you, let's bring it down to the friend level, right? If your friend starts doing something wrong, it is your friend's responsibility to bring them in. Um, we have a responsibility 
to follow our laws. The United States has something known as Leahy laws. Leahy laws, uh, the Leahy law prohibits the United States from providing military and funding and other kinds of uh, defense assistance to governments that are involved in gross human rights violations. That's U.S. law. And what we just saw was a State Department official that just resigned last week who is in the thick of these types of defense transfers program saying that we are not applying Leahy laws to what is going on with our ally. It's, it, 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 this is about, this, in a lot of ways, this is about the United States and, um, and our commitment. Now, I know and we see that uh, President Biden has been engaging Netanyahu and we are seeing them urging restraint in some ways. I know you're seeing this and a lot of people may be rolling their eyes and I'm not here to, to change anyone's mind. What I am here to say is that um, is that I think that that people organizing is working. And I can at least tell you that historically, as much movement as there was, and I'm just gonna be real, as much movement as there was on the ground, and I'm not saying that people weren't organizing on this issue before, but I will say in my five years in Congress, I got almost no calls, me, almost no calls into my office advocating for Palestinian human rights. So, I don't know what that means, that she got no calls. All I can say is, she's been strong about certain issues, and maybe that's why she hasn't got called about this issue altogether. It seems like she wants to be involved really strongly, and I suggest she should. And this is a woman that can get what she wants through passion of how she feels about it, desire to help. And so, I think she should go for it. But yeah, I mean, the thing that everyone trips out of when it comes to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is the Green New Deal. And I, I talked about it in my show. If you ever have a chance, go to SLK Universe on YouTube and look at uh, Moral High Ground. I mean, not Moral High Ground. My Mental Monologue. <laughs> okay, go to My Mental Monologue. It was one of the first shows I created on YouTube. And I made an episode called Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I tried to make it humorous as well as uh, just talk about her in general. Try to get to know her. People get the wrong conception. But I had this whole thing where I was going to talk about every politician and refer them to gods because I know all the Greek mythologies and a lot about gods. It's a hobby of mine. Most people like reading romance books or action books or some crap. I really like reading... Uh, ancient texts of gods and I like reading about um, philosophy in every culture and I, these are things I read a hell of a lot so philosophy and biblical stuff and even legends I like a lot of legends and stuff will pop up and I'll start thinking about it hence why we're having this conversation about biblical prophecy because the Bible is one of the, the best sources I ever read from and it actually helped me to read better than Hell, comic books, which was the main thing I read when I was little. So, it's just a, a trip. I and mean, even with that, though, with reading comic books, it's like, you'll read a series, and people think when you read a comic book that this is, this is all, because they call it, they, call, they say canon nowadays, it's all canon. But, in all reality, if I became a writer for DC Universe, or DC, and I wrote a story, and I wrote it for five years, kept adding more layers to the story, and then I quit that story and move on to something else, and then somebody else takes on the story of the character I've already created for five years and starts changing that character and adding more stuff to it, more layers, then everything I wrote becomes absolute. So with comic book heroes and stuff, the main argument people always have is it makes no sense. Oh, this is not the truth. This, 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 that. They always try to discredit something about the hero that you know because they know a, a certain version that they read, but none of the versions are accurate because you gotta think these characters have been around for, shoot, 70, 80 years, especially if you're talking DC, it's been around for almost 100 years now. 
and Marvel was more like the 60s it was created so 50, 60s, somewhere in there so the thing about these characters and I know this is weird because I'm talking about politicians and uh, Iraq but just go with what I'm saying here and <laughs> so the thing of what I'm saying is after all those years and people keep adding layers and changing things and all this to these characters none of it's 100% accurate but when you go to mythology the bible it doesn't matter which Bible, because there's many different types. Like I said before, there's a Gideon, and, you know, you got the Apocrypha, you got the, obviously, you got the Torah, which is actually the five books of the, of the beginning of the Bible. You have multiple other things and sources that will lead you to, because there's a lot of Christian faiths here in America, and a lot of them are different. They try to change the Bible to suit their uh, culture and their belief system. So... There's certain things that set in stone even when you read these other Bibles that will never change. In every book, Abraham tries to sacrifice Isaac. In every book, Jesus gets crucified. In every book, Noah splits the Red Sea. I mean, Moses splits the Red Sea. In every book, Noah uh, travels on sea with his family. So, I mean, it's just these certain things are set in stone will never change. There might be more things added or taken away, but this is main thing of biblical prophecy and it goes the same way with Zeus or Jupiter depending on if you're reading Roman mythology so like I said just by me talking about it this way you can tell I'm interested in it and that's how most people read is you find something you're interested in and you're able to learn a hell of a lot just think of a time period or a culture or something that you dig and read about it okay don't just watch a movie or whatnot, the most of my knowledge, it might seem like my stuff is movies, because I do that to relax, and sometimes it just trips me out, like, whoa, you know, I grew up on TV and movies, but books is where I obtain most of my knowledge, and that's where anybody can obtain their knowledge if they take the time and, and to sit back and train themselves, and you can do that, and so this is where this woman is knowledgeable too, because Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez knows her stuff, she sat there and did it, but where she doesn't know is when she's talking this Green New Deal and talking about helping energy, getting rid of uh, carbon emissions and stuff like this. Her knowledge there is kind of flawed to me. And I'm not hating Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but me knowing what I know about the environment and stuff, we don't get rid of carbon emissions by getting rid of cows or cars. You gotta have less people driving cars. You gotta make it more comfortable so we don't have to. And you gotta change things up a bit, but not force these battery cars on people, not force, uh, and in college that has nothing to do with, I don't care how you put it, it has nothing to do with the environment. It has something to do with people's self, uh, satisfied, 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 <laughs> God dang it, being self-satisfied <laughs> that they don't have to pay debt back. So that's what that has to do with that. But otherwise, you know, she should have watched Captain Planet when she was a kid or something, you know. Learn that you got to put more trees out. You got to find a way to get rid of toxic waste. You got to recycle, man. You got to do things like this to change the, the environment as well as plant things. Find open areas. Try to re uh, terraform things and make things grow and make more oxygen. This is how we fix the planet. We don't fix the planet by buying cars from China and paying off college debt. And that's the only flaw in the Green New Deal. Well, there's probably more. And if you're interested, we can look for clips because we're talking YouTube here. You can go look for Marjorie Taylor Greene, go off about why she tried to challenge Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez multiple times on the Green New Deal and to no avail. But that doesn't mean that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is wrong. It's just a person when they got a plan and idea, they want to see it through and they want to make sure it works. So, I'm just saying that. But I'm going to say she should have thought, learn more. And this is the thing that I think they have to do to invest more into the things they're trying to create and believe in so we can make it work. And that's all it needed was more uh, research and more people that be allies with her. Otherwise, it's kind of flaw. And true enemy when it comes to our environment is carbon-14. And I said this a billion times. No one listens to me. I would get deeper more into it, but I'm trying to truly talk about AOC here and uh, Israel. 
and the meaning of the fate, I should say, of the people at war in Israel. And so, I'll go back to it. I'm quit trying to rant, but I'm ranting, so I don't know. Anyway. There's a lot of people who post on Twitter, and, that, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying is that that was not translating into civic action and organizing. It just wasn't. In five years, like a handful of calls about Palestinian human rights. In the last two weeks, week and a half, um, hundreds of calls, hundreds, if not past beyond a thousand at this point, from my own constituents, my own people living within the borders of New York's 14th Congressional District, um, talk, advocating for ceasefire and advocating for, um, for de-escalation in this matter. And, um, and that organizing and that message, I would just say to not relent um, in, civic, in your civic organizing and do not, you know, don't buckle to cynicism, to people saying that, you know, that, that the script has already been written. It hasn't. See, now this is why I say she's a great Alexandria Cortez. That's some wisdom right there. Hold that and remember that because this is what people are truly supposed to do. She's right. It's 100% right. Um, I say this because it is so important for us to center our humanity here. Israeli people are not the Israeli government. Palestinians are not Hamas. Our shared humanity is going, is, is what gives us hope. And um, I'm seeing some comments here, you know. Uh, Before she gets in those comments, just a little bit on what she just said. So at the end there, what she's saying that these people are not Hamas and all that, they're not the government, that needs to be known in the United States of America because when people come from another country and then they want to label them, I had this friend who was obsessed with hate in China, and I was talking about ancient, ancient China, ancient masters of Kung Fu and Buddhist monks and stuff, and he was just going off with this hatred shit, and it's the stupidest crap. Everyone is Asian, or especially from China, is not the Chinese government. They're over here in America for a reason because they're rebelling against the Chinese government. And there wouldn't be no foreigners in this country. It would just be what has always been black, whites, and Native Americans running around going crazy, hating each other. But no, <laughs> we got all these other cultures because these people want asylum. They want to get away from these countries that are wicked. So because they come from that country, that doesn't mean necessarily they are that country. They are that belief. You know, the only thing I can think of a situation where people are still loyal to their country in our country will be Mexican. I see a lot of Mexicans support the, the soccer games and, and whatnot, or football in their world and whatnot, and they'll cheer for Mexico instead of cheering for America. And that's a good thing because that means they still have loyalty to their country. But the bad thing about it is America can't support Central America as America. And when I say Central, I mean Mexico. And, and when I say South America, I, I didn't say it, but I'm saying it now. We need to support that too. We just all need to become one big ass country. Okay? Instead of separating South and North and da 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 da. You know, and throw Canada in the mix and get them out, you, you know, out from underneath the Queen's dirt, even though the Queen is gone, so underneath, you know, the Prince's nose. Or is he a king now? I don't know. Anyway, I went off topic again. Never mind. Uh, one person saying, as a Jewish person, I need you to speak out against anti-Semitism too. I would be more than happy to. Anti-Semitism. And I, I also, we, we cannot also not talk about the Islamophobia that we're seeing in this moment as well. Um, but it is very scary. And I also think it's very important for us to hold space. You know, one of the most valuable things, conversations I had in the last week, was that someone said, um, one of the things that's so difficult about managing this issue, at least in terms of domestic U.S. politics, is um, is how driven by fear it is. And once people are um, are scared, 
um, your brain only reverts to two or three um, places, which is like fight, flight, uh, fight, flight, and then a lot of times people will say like they'll add a third or they'll add a fourth, freeze, you know, whatever it may be. It was so obvious she was trying to say fight or flight, but anyway, she did, she, she's probably right about a third issue, but I don't know what the hell that one would be, except for surrender, you know. I mean, that's the only other one you could think of, fight, flight, or surrender, you know. So, anyway. Um, and when our fear is activated, then we can't, when your fight or flight is activated, we go back into our corners, and it becomes very difficult to discuss any issue. Um, and, and it's important to kind of dismantle that. So anyways, someone had asked me to talk about anti-Semitism, and I'm also going to talk about uh, Islamophobia. I mean, the thing about this Islamophobia thing has been going on for way too long, and it's just sad. You know, the whole conversation is just sad and weird, and I say sad because a lot of good people have died in America that were of Islam belief based off the fear, ignorance they had towards that country. And even people close in, in, in my uh, world that died behind that crap. So it doesn't make any sense. And when it comes to the Jewish people, I would believe that she would get a lot of messages in her office from people in New York, because New York is basically Jewish based as well as Italian and so forth. But most people that are Jewish are in, that's in America, are in New York. So it makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I think they should try to support Israel and stand for them on their thing. But as for the other country, they have to decide. Something has to give. Pretty much something has to give. give. And seeing how she's the only one talking about it like this, I believe she should be the forerunner for supporting the uh, people who support Israel in her state as well as uniting other people with the same beliefs in other states. It could happen. We are an environment, a domestic U.S. environment, of a lot of fear right now as well. And, um, and it's important to name that. And I think one of the challenges that there's been has been that because people disagree with the fact that a person feels that way, because they feel like a person's fear is not justified because they don't, you know, they have a, a, a different assessment. Um, it doesn't take away that emotional state, which then charges and drives on a, on a large level. Uh, we have a responsibility to protect one another. And as a Congresswoman for the Bronx and Queens, my primary responsibility is to my constituents and the safety of, um, of our Muslim and Jewish communities. Uh, and that becomes an even higher priority in such a tense time as this. Um, and so it's important and I'm very proud of what I've seen in, in uh, the discipline of certain spaces. We've also seen very troubling um, incidents of anti-Semitism that must be called out and checked immediately. And we've also seen very disturbing incidents of Islamophobia as well. Um, we've seen violence happen. And it's, it, 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 we cannot allow that to get out of control here. That's something that will always happen, I believe, because we're talking about two religious sets, two cultures, biblical sets, that's been fighting since time immemorial, the very beginning when Earth was young. You know, some people believe uh, when Abraham had a kid with Rhaegar and that kid, uh, Ishmael, became a belief of the Muslim faith. And, you know, Isaac's a, you know, the, pretty much the head of the Jewish, you know, bloodline. So that right there shows that it's been going on forever, and it will probably continue to go on forever. I think the only thing that would stop it would for them to have a miracle that shows that they're both right, or they're both the same people. I, I believe Jesus had a conversation with the woman in the well. Uh, the disciples had went to another town, or they were supposed to meet Jesus in this town. Jesus stops and he, he goes by his well and there's a Sumerian woman 
uh, going from the well, and she's talking to him, and the conversation to me is kind of funny. I can't really remember word for word right now. I have to have the Bible in front of me. Um, but I used to know it pretty well. The woman asked him questions, and then he was just like, pour me some water. <laughs> it made Jesus like a man, that conversation, a regular man. And that's why he's a son of man, even though they say he's a son of God. But he referred to himself as a son of man. But the conversation there, you know, usually they don't talk to uh, Jewish people or Hebrew people. And he had the whole conversation with the woman and actually explaining that, you know, that they're no different and stuff like that. You just have to look it up. It's always either in uh, Luke or Matthew. But my point of this is, is this the only thing that could stop a war, true war, between those two sets would be a divine uh, miracle, something of divine faith to come and say, okay, cut it out. Y'all was fighting the, the dumb war because you're the same people. And that's just it. Um, to some folks who are saying, you know, I saw someone say like, why didn't you use your platform until now? I wanna be super upfront about that. I have been vocal and active about this issue. Um, it has largely been on uh, on Twitter because I'm working and I am pushing legislation. I'm organizing. I'm meeting with um, with with many different advocates uh, and such like that. And so I've only personally had been able to focus on one social media platform, um, and so that has largely been Twitter or X. But um, but that's why I went on live today. Instagram can be a little uh, trickier sometimes because you have to like make images and whatnot. Um, but um, but I'm happy to you know if you, if you look up um, my posts on Twitter, you can see that I've been talking about this. Um, I apologize um, for not being more active on Instagram, but I'm also this is these are still like my accounts, like they're not run by staff this is my instagram account on my phone uh, same thing with my twitter account um believe it or not some people a lot of people would say that's crazy and it kind of is but mm -hmm. yeah. she's you know focused on how she presents herself across platforms twitter x whatever you call it i've just started recently getting back on it and i don't know what the hell to do on it same thing with the the wannabe uh, twitter that Instagram created. I don't know what the hell to do with that. So I just post all this stuff on there. So you'll see stuff on there. And I, at first I tried making comments of things I felt that was important, but I don't really see any purpose in doing that. And I don't even know if I want to continue having either one of those platforms. But she does really well presenting herself online, like I said before in the other video, because like, like I said, right now she's even telling you that she's using her own phone her own stuff. She doesn't have some corporate guy or assistant doing it for her. She's doing it herself. And like I said, she's doing it at home to make you feel relaxed and comfortable. So props to AOC for being a person and showing that at least someone in Congress is. That's where it is. Um, and, um, you know, I know that there's, again, uh, uh, plenty of critiques to to be made, um, including tons of critiques about what I'm sharing with you all right now and how I'm sharing it. Uh, I'm not saying that those critiques are wrong. I'm there's no way to speak about this perfectly, and also I'm speaking to this um, to eight million people um, that are on this platform that come from all different kinds of backgrounds on this conflict, that come from almost no understanding of it, to those who have lived it um, but I thought and continue to think that it is important um, for you all to hear from me directly and um, what's so important is to continue to remain civically engaged I know people roll their eyes at calling their member of Congress you're rolling your eyes because people in power want you to roll your eyes like it's not cool mm, so some of that line she just said there that's a deep line that should blow everybody's freaking mind what she just said she goes 
you're rolling your eyes because the people in power want you to roll your eyes. So she's telling you right there, even though she's in Congress, even though there's a government that works with you, supposed to work with you, that there's someone in power that wants you to roll your eyes, that wants you to turn your back, wants you to stick your nose up in here and be like, oh, the hell what you talking about? She's telling you right there, there's somebody hidden behind the bars, behind the scene, behind the curtain, and once you pull the curtain back, it's Richard Pryor, he's like, oh, man, you know, it's some crazy shit, you know, and so that's the truth of the reality of things, is there's somebody behind the curtain pulling the strings of this whole shebang and a damn show ain't a Democrat and a Republican. It's something beyond them that you ain't even seen, that none of us have seen. And when we find out, it's going to blow our minds. and might cause war and conflict within the country and nation itself. And so we want to see the guy behind the curtain before we keep listening to all the little drones that worship and, and we don't know what the hell they're doing. They're just doing things because they're convinced that there's a president and that's who they're working for. I'm telling you, it's like the Wizard of Oz. You, you stay hearing about this wizard, you don't see the wizard. And then <laughs> when you finally figure out who the wizard is, it's Richard Pryor. It makes no sense. Okay. To not call your member of Congress. You're not like cooler than everybody for thinking that you've dismissed this system. Let me tell you what's going on. While everyone's saying, oh, Congress doesn't work, I'm sitting my butt at home, we get calls from from people who are advocating for status quo all the time all the time you know you know how many fox news watchers call my office on a consistent basis and it matters it it does matter even if your member of congress doesn't respond to you you should know that they know that you are calling you should know that it's not like cool or trendy to be cynical. It really isn't. It's not, it doesn't like make you more knowledgeable or better than anybody else saying, oh, calling your member of Congress is pointless. The war machine's gonna go on. That is an excuse to do nothing. So what's she saying here? She's trying to back up how Congress need to be more connected to the people is what I'm getting out of this whole conversation or vice versa. The people need to be more uh, outspoken with how they feel about, you know, Congress and the government and, and give them some kind of word up, head, head up, you know, word, head, yo, smoky, bear. As <laughs> right that we start saying stuff. But still, that's what she's talking about. But I, I would say she should, instead of getting so deep into this issue should have cut it short right there and ended it instead of because now it's not about the war it's about people communicating with congress and i believe people the problem with american people is they see things as a monarchy even though it's not and so you see people in congress and you know lawyers and judges and well, not lawyers but they see people in congress like uh royalty like that's the duchess of chicken wings or something and this is the duke of butt knockers and, and fart holes and whatnot and so they look at them like they're royalty when really they're just congress people but in england or medieval times or something they would be a duchess or you know viceroy or you know some kind of advocate and so this is what they do so they don't feel like they got anything to do because they let the government run themselves and so people will not communicate so she's speaking out for this thing is a good thing but at the same time I think it should have been a whole nother video she should have did just talking on that issue alone because that's a true issue that could be a whole conversation about how communication should truly be connected with the people in Congress and the government as a whole and the American people because I believe just like the wealthy people that are celebrities Congress and the rest of the government is so far away from what it feels like to be a normal American citizen, they do not understand. And so every time they go in these little offices, these congressroom floors, all that, the Senate, all that, okay, they don't talk about what we really care about. They only talk about what they think we care about. Or the ones that actually do reach out and talk about they care about, but not what we as wholes, normal people, care about. So, anyway, 
to just tweet from your couch. Now's the time to get up and to engage our community and to come together, to come together as a community on shared values and principles of humanity. And um, we have to do it by and also remaining vigilant and remaining accountable. If you see a claim, especially one that is shocking, find a second source. Find a second source. So as you see, saying exactly what I be saying all the time on this little podcast, we have to come together. We have to come together, we have to communicate, we have to understand each other. In the United States of America, the government has to find this a responsibility and get closer to the people before they make decisions that we don't care about. Disinformation and misinformation is flying all over the place in all directions. We have to be responsible stewards of what we share. And it's not great, but that's the information age that we live in. And so, um, you know, that is just what I uh, advocate for. Someone said, drop the number. Um, I will, I can share it on my story, but I, if you've been, oh, in addition to Twitter, I've also been doing email because that's longer form. Um, so you can sign up for our email newsletter at ocasiocortez.com. Um, and you'll get our, our longer form updates about this. Um, and we've been emailing um, the number and, I, and uh, social media link as well for how you can look up your rep and call your representative. So I'll post that on my story when I'm done and wrapping up here. Um, See, good things, that's, good. that's a good thing. At least someone's trying to explain how you can actually reach out to your local government or, you know, the government. And, you know, listen, I'm sure people are going to continue arguing um, from the quote-unquote left or right or up or down or whatever and taking, you know, one sentence of of this longer live out of context and whatever the heck it is. But... um, (laughs) I hope I'm not taking all this out of context and stuff. So (laughs) I hope I'm actually making sense. But... In all reality, yeah, this last part is, is pretty good for her to explain that we do need communication because that's where I'm at. We need to change the way the country works because it is plummeting. It is falling deep into this downward spiral that could only lead to chaos and the destruction of humanity. And I'm not interested in chaos. I'm interested in preserving the species of humanity. And I'm also interested and try to bring peace and prosperity to not just our country, but to the world. And yes, I don't got the powers to do that, but if people come together, it can be a reality. You know, it's worth the risk. It's worth the political cost because for me, my primary motivation right now is to save lives and to figure out what is the best strategy for saving lives. Um, and uh, the best strategy is to give me some super powered suit a whole bunch of this give me a team I need a team of 12 people okay both males and females I need them to be kung fu masters and all kinds of stuff I need psychics I need all kinds of crap I need the x-men people or the this, and I will fix the problems of this nation um, I'm just doing my best like everybody else and with that let us hope and if you're a praying person i'm a praying person um i'm just i just pray that um that we get some sort of relief in the coming week um that lives are saved in the coming week um and the tearing apart of families and children uh stop in the coming week um and um you know, another day and um, another movement and just trying to do the right thing. Um, but again, it's uh, it's important for us to hold space for one another, to hold grace for one another, um, and to also understand the grief and the trauma 
that has been activated uh, by so many people that uh, that uh, were affected on on October 7th and every day since October 7th. So thank you all so much and wish you the best. Well, see, that was good. That was a good little ending, a good speech and everything from the great Ocasio-Cortez. And uh, yes, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez made a hell of a lot of sense in this interview. And this is why I wanted to share it with you guys and throw my little two cents in. I got a little twisted about and random because of my mind's thinking of all kinds of things. And I try to explain myself and maybe I don't explain myself properly. And hopefully I didn't tear this thing apart and you guys understood it. But morally it is right to unite and bring peace and just love each other, man. And with that being said, peace be with you all and blessings upon you always. Uh, just check out things and make sure you can do what she said. Contact your congressperson. With that, peace.